You know, there's all sorts of um, ways of finding a date nowadays. And uh, there was a, a dating event that was specifically held for the elderly who were single and wanted to have companionship and find love. And after one such event, this dating uh, event for the agency, uh, for the elderly rather, uh, Bob sent Alice an email. And he wrote this in his email, Dear Alice, I must be getting so forgetful. I know I proposed to you last night, but I've forgotten whether you said yes or no. He got a reply back from Alice, who said, Dear Bob, it's good, so good to hear from you. I know I said no to someone last night, but I've forgotten who it was. Thank you. <laughs> Do you start well, but never finish or finish badly? Do you kind of start a job and never seem to get it completed? You know, you kind of make an effort, you get going on it, and then something else comes along and you put it to one side and you move on to something else and you never finish the job. Maybe you start a diet, a new hobby, start a book, and never actually finish it. Today we're beginning this new series on this very topic. It's called Finish Strong. And it's all from the letter that we see in our Bibles to Timothy, written by Paul to Timothy. And Paul wrote this around about the year AD 66. While Paul was in Rome, in prison, awaiting his death. He had the death sentence. So here he is in this prison, chains, dark, dirty dungeon, very few privileges, very few comforts. And he writes this second letter to Timothy with the end very much of his life in sight. And yet when we read through to Timothy, as we're going to in the next four weeks, it is full of celebration. There is notes of sadness, there is notes of urgency, but by far it's, it's an emotional letter and it's celebratory. And the letter climaxes, we will see in four weeks time, where Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And you might think that awaiting death in prison is not finishing strong. What we will learn from the Apostle Paul writing this letter to Timothy is that finishing faithful is finishing strong. In fact, you could even say of Paul, finishing at all is finishing strong. I want to show a little video clip uh, for you now uh, of a race that happened quite a long time ago now. But let's just quickly look at it. Two races left on the calendar after the finish. And, and right now, Tony, we see our number two for Central University now about to shoot. Their number three, who was previously number two, is now walking the last yes. 80 meters. She is in severe duress here trying to finish up. Uh, this is the guts that cross country brings out in athletes. This is very gutty here. All the way through giving for her teammates. She's got about 30 meters to go. 993. Holding her so, so well. Oh boy, we about five meters. Hopefully she will get back up. I've got There's a decision here if she gets assistance, of course. This is... This is decision time. They're asking her how she's feeling. This is cross country. If they country. touch her, that would be disqualify her. So they're asking her, can you make it? And look at her. Such a courageous effort trying to cross that finish. The crowd is giving her all they can here at the finish. As soon as she crosses, they will scoop her up and take her to the medical tent right away. And there she did it. 
What a great effort by that athlete from East San Francisco University. Once again, the, the team favorites here giving it all they have. That runner was a teenage girl called uh, Holland Reynolds. She was from San Francisco University High School. She was a high performance runner who had pushed herself to the limit. And during that day's competition, she finally, uh, just her body gave out on her. And she collapsed just yards away from the finish line. Now her body gave out on her, <laughs> but not her spirit. And on her hands and knees, she crawled the rest of the way. Did she finish strong? Some might say, mm, well, that was a pretty weak finish, but... Well, you know, there's a little story behind that, which you may have picked up a little bit on the commentary. By finishing that race, by her finishing the race, even on her hands and knees, she earned enough points to qualify her whole team to win the state track championship. If she had given up, if she had stopped short of the finish line and just Ah, I can't do any more. The whole team wouldn't have won. But she finished. And she finished, therefore, strong. And the whole team won. Over the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about how we can finish the race that we have begun. So let's look at uh, chapter 1 in 2 Timothy. Again, you have your Bibles open in front of you uh, to 2 Timothy. As you're doing that, let me just say that Timothy was a leader of the church in Ephesus. You've heard of the letter to the Ephesians. Well, Timothy was a leader at that church. It meant actually that it was more of a lot of house groups that were meeting in the city. And tradition has it that he also spent time in prison. And indeed, in the end, was martyred in AD 90. That's Timothy. So 2 Timothy is really Paul's final farewell letter to the churches that he served. And in looking at the passage that we've read today, 1 Timothy 1 to 18, I'm going to talk about some of the things that many of us struggle with when it comes to kind of winning the race of finishing strong in our lives. And we need to break free from some of these things and you might recognize some of these things today that hold us back because we often find ourselves bound by fear and complacency and shame that stop us fully finishing strong in the, in the purpose that we have in our lives. But as Paul writes to Timothy, we see a clear call to rise above those obstacles that are before him and indeed before us and boldly live for Christ. So to say, open that Bible, keep it there, we'll have a look through it. And in this passage, the Apostle Paul writes, as I say, from prison, facing the end of his life. And despite his circumstances, Paul is, Paul is full of faith and courage and this sense of purpose and drive. You read through it, as we will do over the next four weeks. If you want to get ahead, then during this week, read the whole of 2 Timothy. And he writes to encourage this young leader, Timothy, a young pastor who is struggling with his own fear and timidity. You might say he was timid Timothy. It's a bit of a tongue twister. But Paul reminds him that he's, he has a calling and that the power of the Holy Spirit can help him overcome the things that are holding him back at this moment. So let's explore three key ways that Paul's message can help us break free from holding uh, back on things today. If, you've got, if you like list writing, one, two, and three today, okay? Three point message. Don't always do those, but so you know where we're going. First one, break free from fear. From fear. They're all chained up. 
and fear can really hold us back from where we want to go. And Paul says in verses 6 and 7, if you read them, about fanning the flame of your gift. He begins by encouraging Timothy in verse 6. Fan into flame the gift of God. Fan into flame. Come on. He then adds in verse 7. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, Timothy, but gives us what? Power and, and, yeah, power, love, self-discipline. Depends what version you're reading. And fear can be like it's on a chain around us. And, and, and we can't move, we can't complete the race, we can't finish strong because of fear. It holds us back. Fear is one of the most common things that holds people back from achieving, from finishing the race, from being strong. Whether it's fear of failure. Oh, no, I, you know, I, I can't do that, I can't step out and do those things because I, I might fail and then what, how am I going to feel? What's other people going to think of me? Fear of rejection. Fear of the unknown. I, I don't know what goes ahead, so I, I'm just going to stay where I am, okay? And so fear can hold us back from doing that which we want to do and believe that we can do and believe that God is calling us to. Fear can hold us back, it can even paralyze us, just freeze us from using the gifts that God has given to us. But Paul reminds Timothy, and also us, and also you online, that we have been given a spirit of power, not of fear. Power, not of fear. So what Gifts. It talks about fanning the flame and using the gifts. And so what gifts has God given to you? Last Thursday in the Olive Room in our study time, we went through the gift of the Spirit. If you were there, then I still encourage you to keep working through the, the process of the things that I gave you to do so that you work through and understand what gifts God has given you or may have given you. If you weren't there on Thursday and you're thinking, I'm not quite sure about what gift God has given to me, then see me afterwards. We'll talk about it. We'll get you going on it. Because it's important. You know, whether it's leadership, whether it's teaching, whether it's hospitality, whether it's just being creative, whether it's being prayerful, all sorts of gifts that God gives to us. And we need to use those gifts and not be fearful of what if. Don't let fear keep you from stepping into those gifts and using those gifts. Fan the flame, says Paul. Fan the flame. It's like getting that, that, I'm breaking it. Break free of it. Break free of fear. Because we know that God is all powerful. We know that he is taking us forward. We know that he's given these gifts to use. So start using the gift, even in little ways. Even if it's just to start with, it's just a small way. Just trusting that God's spirit will empower you each step of the way to help you grow and break free of fear. It also talks about shame in this letter, in this first chapter. Shame. Shame can hold us back. Paul talks in verses 8 to 12 about embracing your identity in Christ. Embracing your identity in Christ, who you are. And Paul uses the word ashamed several times in this first chapter in 2 Timothy. Verse 8, so do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord. Verse 12, yet I am not ashamed because I know what I have believed. We just sung that. Verse 16, I'm going to unnew as soon as I paused for a moment and thought about it. Omnisphorus, 
often refreshes me and was not ashamed of my chains. That's Paul's physical chains in prison. In other words, this guy was not ashamed to associate with Paul even though he was a condemned man in a prison. He wasn't afraid of that. He wasn't ashamed of that. He wasn't ashamed of Paul for who he was, what he was and where he was. And in verse 8, Paul says, So do not be ashamed about the testimony, sorry, of the testimony about our Lord or of me, this prisoner. Rather join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Shame can hold us back from finishing strong. Shame is a powerful force that can really get inside us. The enemy will use it to get inside. And shame will tell us, you're not good enough. You're not good enough. You, you, you've messed up. You've failed too many times. Or you're unworthy of God's love and God's calling. You, you've, you've messed up. You, you, you do things that are bad in your life. And how's God going to use you? And you, shame will get in and stop you from going and finishing strong. And Timothy may have been tempted to feel ashamed of the gospel or ashamed of Paul's imprisonment. Maybe people were pointing fingers and saying things and so on. But Paul urges him to embrace his identity as a follower of Jesus Christ. Even if it leads to suffering, Paul says. Even if it leads to suffering, there's no shame in that. Look at me, I'm in prison. But I'm finishing strong. And Paul would say the same thing to us. You need to decide who you want to impress. Whose opinion matters in your life and whose opinion doesn't really matter in life. Because we can take a few words out of someone who said something about us or to us and we can feel all ashamed and bad and all that. Why? For that one person perhaps doesn't even know me, doesn't know what's going on, or perhaps they do and they, and they shouldn't be bringing those things up because I am a child of God and I'm moving forward and I'm wanting to serve him. There will always be people who will look at what you do with contempt or condescension. There will always be those who will try and make you feel ashamed of who you are and what you do. Don't give them that power. People try to shame us. We've been putting on at Highfield Facebook posts uh, on the social media there. We've been putting up some things on there, songs and verses and all sorts of things on there. And uh, people make comments underwards, uh, afterwards underneath. And I don't stop those comments. I mean, it's a free world. People can make comments. After a while, I sometimes hide them because they're just not helpful and they've made their comment. One got to me last week. And I started to think it was a genuine question that was going to end up positive, but it didn't. Because one of the comments in there under our posts in Facebook a guy asked, do you welcome LGBT plus people? Let's pause for a moment. And I wrote, we welcome all people. We welcome them. No matter who they are, we welcome them. And that guy then said, that being the case, you don't believe the words of God. My response was, and I left it after this, that was said of Jesus a lot. Jesus did not accept anything or anyone going against the word of God, but he accepted everyone, no matter who they were, what they'd done, where they were. He accepted them with open arms. And Jesus took a lot of stick for that, of course. And Paul is saying, do not be ashamed to testify about the law. Don't be ashamed. If you want to finish strong, 
You need to decide where your loyalties lie and never let go of them. I am a child of God. We are God's people. And we stand for what is right. And we want to finish strong. So when it comes to shame, break free of it. Break free of it. So that we can finish strong. It reminds me of um, Joshua in the Bible, not our own Joshua. He's leading God's people into the promised land. This is great. We're going in the promised land after all this time. And there's all sorts of moaning going on and there's all sorts of things being said about this amazing moment. This finishing strong, basically. This is God's people going in the promised land. This is it. And some were still having their doubts. Some were still moaning. And Joshua says, Joshua 24, verse 15, some of you know it well. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself which this day whom you will serve. Make up your mind. Whether the gods of your ancestors, sorry, your uh, gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living at the moment. But as for me, says Joshua, and my household, I will serve the law. I am not ashamed. That's where I'm heading. Are there areas in your life where shame is holding you back from doing that which is right. Maybe it's a past mistake. Maybe it's fear of what you did and being ashamed of. And it stops you from living boldly and doing what you know to be the right thing and what God's leading you into doing. Remember that your identity is not from the past, your identity is not in your failures, your identity is not uh, in people's opinions. Your identity is in Jesus Christ. And he's called you to live unashamed of him and the gospel. Last one, you know what's left in. Break free from complacency. Complacency. Verse 13, 14. Guard the good deposit. Guard the good deposit. Story I read last week. Man buys a parrot. Parrot's brilliant. Speaks several languages. He can even do maths. And he's really impressed. And he would go up to the parrot and he says, uh, what's two plus two? And the parrot responds, four. I'm not going to do a parrot voice. Though. And feeling clever, the man then tries to trick the parrot. So he said, OK, what's the square root of 81? And the parrot thinks for a second and says, nine. Amazed by the bird's intelligence. The man said, OK, what's the capital of France? And the bird replies, Paris. And the man is ecstatic. This is, this is incredible. I've got this parrot here. And he can respond in these ways. And a week goes by. And he notices the parrot has stopped talking. No more answers. No more conversations. Just sitting there silently staring off into space and frustrated the man says hey why aren't you talking anymore parrot and the parrot shrugs his shoulders and says hey i figured out i'll just coast it for a while you seem pretty impressed at the, at the beginning of last week <sighs> complacency oh well it's okay i did pretty good you know a few years ago a few weeks ago whatever It kind of almost like, I've retired now. That's what complacency is, isn't it? It's kind of like, oh, 
I've done all right. I can sit back now. But actually that holds us back from achieving, from finishing strong. Because we go, oh, well, I've done this. I've given my heart to the Lord. I've served the church. I've done this. I've done that. Yeah, I can sort of sit back a bit now. What else do I need to do? I thought, I think I'll just coast it for a while. And Paul concludes this section by urging Timothy to keep as the pattern of sound teaching what he's heard and to guard the good deposit that was entrusted to him with the help of the Holy Spirit. In other words, Paul is telling Timothy, stay vigilant, stay committed to the truth of the gospel and keep on going. Don't be complacent. Complacency can be subtle and dangerous. And the enemy likes to get us to be complacent. Oh, you're all right now. You're okay. You've done good. It's so easy, isn't it, to get comfortable. To lose our sense of urgency. To stop pushing ourselves to grow. But Paul reminds us to break from complacency. That's James. Because we have a responsibility as Christ followers to guard and grow what God has entrusted to us. We can't just say, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm just taking a break now. I I've deserved it because I've been doing what you want me to do for the last 40 years, so I'll just have a little breather now. Where have you grown complacent? In your faith or in your calling? Maybe you've settled into now a routine. It's kind of, oh yeah, I'll just go to church on Sunday morning, I'll be with the brothers and sisters, we'll have a great time, we'll have a bit of a fellowship, and uh, then I'll go home. And I'll do it again next Sunday. Rest of my life, I'll just do what I want to do, and I'll just coast it. God has placed something special in you, and He hasn't taken it away. He's got something for you to do, and me to do, and us to do, and you to do. And we need to break out of complacency and keep going and keep growing so that we make an impact for the kingdom of God. God has given us a spirit of power, of love and self-discipline, says Paul. He has called us to live boldly for Christ and to finish strong, whatever that is for you. So let's break free of fear by fanning the flames of God's gifts within us. Let's break free from shame and embrace our identity in Christ. And let's guard the good deposit of faith in us by breaking free of complacency. And when we do, we'll find ourselves living in the fullness of God's purpose in our lives. And we will finish strong. Let's pray. Father, I believe that word that we've just read and heard is a word for us today in October 2024. And I pray, Lord, that as we take on board your word, that we may recognize those things which are holding us back from finishing strong. And I pray, Lord, that we may break free from them even today. that we may, even if it's like that girl who was just slipping away and falling on the floor, I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna keep going, Lord, because you've given me a goal to get to. You've given me a task to finish. Even though I have to do it on my hands and knees, I'm gonna do it for you, Lord. Let me break free of anything that hinders me 
and let me run the race and finish strong. In Jesus' name, amen.